All right, hello everyone, and welcome to tonight's debate on pornography, and welcome to this weekend's event, Beyond the Gender Wars, Restoring Harmony Between Man and Woman. My name is Marlo Slayback, and I'm the National Director of Student Programs at the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. First, a word of thanks to the Diana Davis Spencer Foundation for their support of tonight's debate um, on whether pornography should be regulated. And I just want to say a quick word about what we do at ISI, especially for um, our uh, new members who are joining us today and new students. Um, for the last 70 years, ISI has stepped into the breach to educate for liberty on college campuses. We see more and more every day that universities are engaged in a project of culture repudiation and an intellectually and morally bankrupt formation. We see the results of this in our leadership class, which one ISI professor recently described as a pattern of failing upwards, and then rinsing and repeating. As part of our mission, educate for liberty and raise a new leadership with the principles and virtues that have made America free and prosperous, we host an array of seminars, campus lectures, and our flagship honors program, which I've met a few of you tonight who will be participating this summer career in journalism. And if that sounds like, or if any of what I'm saying sounds some, like something you'd like to be interested in, uh, please come see me or one of my colleagues after the debate or at some point this weekend and I can get you more connected with ISI um, or visit our website, isi.org. On to introducing our debate. Tonight's debate moderator is Rod Dreher, who is editor at large at the American Conservative and was senior editor at the American Conservative for 12 years. A veteran of three decades of magazine and newspaper journalism, he has also written three New York Times bestsellers, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, including Live Not By Lies, The Benedict Option, and Little Way of Ruthie Lemming, as well as Crunchy Cons and How Dante Can Save Your Life. Jer lives in Budapest, Hungary. Thank you for joining us all the way from Europe hey. today, uh, Rod. I'll introduce our debaters as well, starting with Charles C.W. Cook, who is a senior writer at National Review. He hosts a Charles C. Cook podcast podcast and is the author of The Conservatarian Manifesto. Charles is a graduate of the University of Oxford where he studied the modern history of politics. He moved to the United States in 2011, became an American citizen in 2018, and lives in Florida with his wife and two children. Ali Stuckey is the host of the podcast Relatable where she breaks down the latest in culture, news, and politics from a Christian conservative perspective. She's a frequent guest on Fox News and other media, and the writer and author of the best-selling book, You're Not Enough and That's Okay. In 2015, Allie began speaking to college sororities about the importance of voting. In 2016, she started a Facebook page called The Conservative Millennial. After a few months, the page started to take off, getting hundreds of thousands and then millions of views. In 2017, she accepted an offer from The Blaze as a contributor and began offering commentary on a variety of cable and online TV shows. By 2018, she had moved to CRTV to start her podcast. CRTV and The Blaze later merged to form uh, Blaze TV. Today, in addition to podcasting, writing, and making the occasional satirical video, Ali speaks to a broad array of gatherings and organizations, including colleges, about the, in in about the importance of constructing a biblical worldview. Please join me in welcoming all three of our speakers tonight. Thank you, Marlo, and thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. I lived in Dallas for six years and never once made it to the UD campus, so it's a pleasure to fly all the way from Budapest to come here, and thank you all for coming out. I'm just going to give you a little rundown of how this is going to work tonight. We are going to start by hearing uh, an initial statement from Allie and then uh, Charles is gonna make an initial statement. Each one will have an eight minute rebuttal. And uh, then we're gonna go to a moderated discussion uh, among us. After that, we'll have an audience Q&A for about 25 minutes. Let me warn you now, I will beg you and then I'll warn you that don't stand up to make a statement, please just get to the question to give our guest a chance to answer. And then we're gonna have two minute closing statements and then off we go to hospitality. So um, again, thank you for being here. I know we're gonna have a really interesting discussion tonight. And uh, without further ado, let me introduce or welcome to the podium, Allie Beth Stuckey. Ten minutes or so? Yeah. 
Do I have a, are you going to time me? Can you, can you let me know? Uh, okay. Don't, don't worry about it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I also, born and raised in Dallas, have never been to the uh, University of Dallas campus. So thank you so much for hosting me. I really appreciate it. Uh, the question that we are debating tonight is, should porn be illegal? I think I actually heard in the introduction the question, should porn be regulated? And I want to start by adding this point of clarification. The question that we're debating specifically right now is not, could porn be illegal? Although I will address that, but specifically, should porn be illegal. And while it is true that we on this stage all say that we agree that pornography is immoral, that its effects have had a negative impact on society, I can't glide past that point of agreement in making my case. Since we are dealing with this question of should, whenever we are dealing with questions of should or should not, we must always deal with the morality and the impact of both sides of that decision. It is my view that if we actually agree on the moral repugnance and the deleterious consequences of porn, then everything else will follow. If we can all agree on the should, then we will figure out the could in a way that both protects society from porn's damage and honors the First Amendment. So let's first focus on this damage that pornography has caused, is causing, will continue to cause. And first I want to focus on children. Uh, children are the primary victims of the progressive sexual and moral uh, revolution that our country is currently undergoing, whether it's gender ideology, the redefinition of the family, reproductive technology, abortion, or COVID policy. Children are always the hardest hit because they are entirely subject to the decisions of adults. They are placed on the altar of adult desire time and again, and nowhere is that more obvious than in the realm of pornography. Research indicates that the average age a child sees porn online is 11, sometimes younger for boys, sometimes a bit older for girls. And we also see in that same research that the earlier that a child is exposed to porn, the more likely and irreversible the rewiring of their brain becomes. A rewiring that makes them more likely to become sexually promiscuous as teens, to engage in sexual violence. This leads to more rapes, more abortions, more unwanted babies, more STDs, more damaged bodies, more broken hearts. All in adolescents who are years away from having a frontal lobe that can properly predict the consequences of their actions. Right now, because of legal, accessible porn, young people can access it all with a tap on their screen. On TikTok, where the hashtag Kink Talk has more than 6.9 billion views and hashtag choke has 375.5 million views. There are thousands of videos of young teenagers engaging in BDSM, including suffocation, choking, copying what they've seen on porn sites like Pornhub. A journalist, Nicholas Kristoff, wrote a groundbreaking piece for the New York Times in 2020 titled The Children of Pornhub. He details the children who have been affected uh, by the pervasiveness of pornography and the ease with which anyone, including a minor, can become a producer and distributor of porn. In Kristoff's research, he found that Pornhub, which is visited millions of times a day, is infested with videos of rape, including the rape of children monetized video compilations under titles like Screaming Teen, She Can't Breathe, or Extreme Choking are all available on Pornhub, all accessible to anyone with Wi-Fi, no matter their age. All attempts by states to require age verification to access Pornhub have been viciously opposed by the company. Child sex abuse material, typically referred to as child pornography, is rampant on thousands of porn sites today. The most heinous acts imaginable, including the violent rape of infants, are right now being monetized online, not on the dark web, but on legally run websites. Yes, this kind of material is illegal, but the abundant availability of legal pornography is what makes it so hard to restrict. To again use Pornhub as an example, some of the most popular searches are 14-year-old or girls under 18, 
These videos are protected because its distributor can claim without any verification that these girls are just acting, that they're really 18 years old. As long as pornography is legally available, this will be their excuse. This will be a problem. And it's not just a problem for children. It's a problem for the adults in the industry too. Liberals and libertarians often argue, well, why should we prevent consenting adults from doing what they want to do on camera? We should allow them to make money how they want to. If it's through filmed sex, then so be it. First, I take issue with this flimsy model of consent-based morality. There is more to morality than consent. If a person consents to being objectified, that's still objectification. And viewing people as objects is wrong and damaging. We don't have to dig very deep to see how viewing people as objects is nothing more than vessels for our passions, be they sexual or violent, causes immense individual and societal harm. And even if consent were the only thing that mattered in deciding whether porn should be legally accessible, it would not pass the test because there is no way to know whether the people in pornographic videos are consenting. Even if they consented initially, we have no way of knowing whether they continue to consent throughout the entire production. Some of the most popular pornographic videos right now are of scared looking or unconscious seeming women being assaulted by multiple men. We have no way of knowing if these women or men have been groomed or trafficked at some point in their lives. We have no way to verify true consent. Porn is the legal loophole for trafficking, rape, prostitution, and child sex abuse. And not only does legal porn make these horrific acts available, it makes them profitable. Let me say that again. Sexually degrading women and children is profitable because pornography is legal. Pornography is also addictive in nature. Like drugs, it stimulates the brain and the body in a way that makes the user crave not just more porn, but more extreme porn. But unlike many drugs, it is, of course, legal and celebrated. Legal porn between consenting, quote unquote, adults is the starting point for those who eventually find their way to child sex abuse or other violent material. And while not all porn users become pedophiles or sexual abusers, you would be hard pressed to find a pedophile or a sexual abuser who was not first a porn user. Users who don't become abusers are still harmed by porn, and so are the ones closest to them. Anti-trafficking organization Exodus Cry has compiled several studies citing the harms of porn. Research from multiple studies demonstrates a correlation between frequent porn usage and acceptance of rape in males as young as 14. You actually lose some gray matter in your brain the more often you watch porn. Frequent use of porn kills real life intimacy because real bodies and real sex rarely live up to the produced performances of porn. It holds men and women to unrealistic sexual expectations, making reality a consistent disappointment, which means that it fuels insecurity, jealousy, discontentment, anger, tearing down relationships, destroying marriages and families, which we understand are necessary for the survival and flourishing of any community or nation. Pornography also informs and exacerbates disturbing sexual trends, including transgenderism. An un undercover operation by sound investigations revealed via the admission of employees of Pornhub's parent company that the Pornhub algorithm feeds trans and homosexual content to users who typically only view heterosexual content. And this is likely effective. Uh, both of the creators and directors of The Matrix are men who now identify as women. And uh, one of them, one of the Wachowski brothers, recently admitted publicly that a, t uh, a common genre of pornography called sissy pornography actually, quote, made him trans. And of course, we know the destruction that transgenderism has wrought on society, normalizing the barbaric practice of butchering bodies, even children's bodies. There is no upside to porn. No positives, no benefits. It is only ever damaging, degrading, and destructive. Its legality and its consequential availability and profitability is a scourge on our country. And it is my belief that if there is a will to be rid of it, there is a way. The truth is we as a society and our leaders do not seem to have the will because if we're honest, we don't think it's as abhorrent as we should. 
porn is obscene. It is generally agreed upon that obscenity is not protected by the First Amendment, but defining obscenity is difficult, even with precedents like the Miller test, nailing down what counts artistically or uh, as artistically or socially valueless is infamously tough. But the First Amendment has always had limits. There are always things, there have always been things that we cannot say in contexts in which speech is limited. The ability to define obscene, irredeemable content isn't beyond us. We know what pornography looks like when children are involved and we have outlawed it. We can do the same for all kinds of pornography. We can, at the very least, make producing and platform, uh, platforming pornography legally and financially risky. We can enforce the obscenity laws already on the books. We can enforce things like Title 18, Section 1465 of the US Code. States can continue to pass restrictions like age verification laws, laws that require verification of age for both consumers of and performers in pornography. We can hold the platforms liable for allowing abuse, trafficking, and other kinds of exploitation. We can outright ban free internet porn so that consuming porn requires an ID and a credit card. Laws can pressure credit card companies to not work with pornography sites or charge exorbitant fees to these sites. There are possibilities. There are ways. Uh, it would take more time than I have, and I'm probably already out of time, to go through the history of obscenity laws in our country, the Supreme Court cases, the legal tests, but America has accomplished greater and more complicated feats than banning porn. I have hope that we are up to the task. In every policy decision that we make, we balance freedom against other values, such as safety, for example. Many times, freedom wins out. But freedom untethered by virtue, unfettered by moral limits, is anarchy. And anarchy always harms the most vulnerable, the most powerless first before wreaking havoc everywhere else. Porn is anarchy. It's anarchy that benefits the corporations profiting from exploitation. As in so many things, when it comes to porn, freedom for the pike is death for the minnow. Freedom to produce and platform porn for the sake of what I believe to be a wrong-headed view of the First Amendment is death and destruction for everyone else. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Now we're going to hear from Charles Cook. Thank you. So uh, glutton for punishment that I am, I'm the lucky guy who gets to take the pro-pornography position in this debate. Um, although, as a matter of fact, I'm not taking a pro-pornography position any more than were this topic a little bit different. I would be taking a pro-hate speech position or a pro-drunkenness position or a pro-mass shooting position. Instead, what I want to take this evening is what I consider to be a practical position. A great deal of conservatism, including my own, is rooted in simple practicality, and I believe that to be the case here, however unpleasant or unfortunate that might be. So let me start by saying what I'm not saying. Unlike some on the libertarian side of this debate, my opposition to this motion that we should ban pornography is not ideological. I am often ideological. I don't think ideological is a bad word, but in this case, it is not ideological. My opposition to this motion is not legal either. I don't think pornography is constitutionally protected. I think insofar as the Supreme Court has suggested that it is, the Supreme Court is wrong. And I think the people who wrote the First Amendment, which, as you'll note, refers to the freedom of speech, which is a term of art, the the matters, has a discrete and established meaning, would agree with that. It can, of course, be hard to determine what constitutes obscenity or pornography. There was a famous case where the justices had to sit down and watch hours and hours of hardcore pornography to determine what they thought was and what they thought wasn't. So you can understand why they might want to get rid of the case completely. But I don't think this is a First Amendment issue at root. And my opposition to this proposal is not moral either. I don't think our culture would be greatly harmed if there were no porn in it. 
much as I don't think our culture would be greatly harmed if there were no heroin in it. But that's not the question. The question is, can we do it? I believe the United States should not ban pornography because I believe that the United States cannot ban pornography. Or to put it another way, I don't believe that the government intervention that this would require would be worth the cost in other areas, even if it were successful, which it wouldn't be. Now, Thomas Sowell, the wonderful economist, observes that there are no solutions in politics. There are only trade-offs. This would require a trade-off, and it's a trade-off that I don't think as a country we want. Now, in this respect, I consider this question to be similar, in a sense, to the debate that we had over prohibition. I'll say at the outset, unlike with pornography, I have strong objections to the banning or limitation of alcohol. I'm from England, which is where the drunks live, and I live at the moment in Florida, which is where the drunks retire. So I have a vested interest uh, in, in drinking. But back when the temperance movement was ascendant, at the turn of the 20th century, the arguments that were being made were serious. There was a problem to be addressed. Back then, people drank a great deal more than they did after Prohibition. Back then, liver disease, cirrhosis of the liver in particular, was ubiquitous. Drunk men routinely abused women in ways that should appall us. Drunk men spent their paycheck at the saloon instead of looking after their families. It's no surprise that the impetus for Prohibition largely came from women. They were the ones who bore the brunt of American public drunkenness. At the time of the founding, uh, the American colonists drank so much alcohol that Thomas Jefferson, who had a bottle of wine every night with dinner, was deemed a teetotaler by other founders. Whatever romantic views you have of the Continental Congress or the drafting of the Constitution, and you should, because these are the two great moments in world history, but the people who were in charge of them were smashed. They were drunk <laughs> for most of the time. And prohibition changed a lot of that for the better. It slashed the instances of alcohol-related domestic violence. It cut infant mortality. It cut cirrhosis of the liver. It reduced admissions to state mental hospitals for alcoholic psychosis. It reduced arrests for public drunkenness. It reduced absenteeism in the workplace. But in the end, it was deemed not to be worth it. Not because all of that parade of horribles wasn't real. It was. But because the enforcement that was necessary sat really uncomfortably within the American constitution and cultural order. Because prior prioritizing prohibition had a cost. Because the organized crime that sprung up had a deleterious effect on Americans, shocked Americans, and because a ban was too blunt a tool. And it was a tool that actually was not anticipated by those who had voted for prohibition, who didn't understand the scale of the enforcement that would be necessary. Now, I believe that a great deal of those problems also obtain here. This is a different debate in 2024 than it was in 1996, than it was in 1976. It's a different debate than it would have been in 1876, because the cat is out of the bag. There are 25 million, that's with an M, there are 25 million porn sites on the internet. And not all of them, by any stretch of the imagination, are in the United States. There is in total on the internet right now about 10,000 terabytes of pornographic material available. That's two million times what you can put on a DVD. Two million times. Now, perhaps you find that grotesque. I do as well. But it's there. It exists, whether you like it or not. It is replicated digitally over and over again, which means that even if you shut down the production of new pornographic material tomorrow, which I think you would struggle to do, especially 
given that everyone has an iPhone with a 4K camera on it, you wouldn't do a thing about all of that material that is already online. Now, yes, what you can do is you can impose regulations on big sites. Ali mentioned some of them. Pornhub is one of them. In Texas at the moment, as a result of House Bill 1181, certain porn sites have blocked access within the state. And there's a sign when you go to them that says, we're no longer operating because of legal uncertainty. Now, why is that? That's because those sites are real businesses. Again, grotesque businesses, but they're real businesses. They file taxes. They have uh, corporate boards. They have shareholders. They have addresses. They have staff. You can call them. That's not most porn sites. Yeah, there are big porn sites that make money and so forth. But most porn sites do not operate like that. Most of the 25 million of them are not like that because they're not above board, because they're not in America, because they're not sites. Perhaps they're peer-to-peer -peer sharing systems. Perhaps they're emails. Perhaps they're FTP servers. And you only need a few of those to survive out of the 25 million to make the whole endeavor fruitless. So unless, and this is the key in my view to this whole argument, unless you want to destroy the internet as it currently exists to fight this scourge, and we agree that it's a scourge, unless you want to impose a massive system of government management and superintendence and surveillance on the web, one that we've never had before, and one that conservatives of all people should be nervous about implementing, then you shouldn't wish to usher in a ban on porn. I certainly don't for exactly that reason. Now, I know a bit about how the internet works because in another role I helped code a, a cloud that hosts a whole bunch of websites. And the biggest misconception about the internet is that there is a thing called the internet. There isn't. The internet is the word we use to describe a whole bunch of decentralized systems that are extremely easy for anyone to access. Anyone in this room can do it. If you have a laptop, you can download open source software to turn it into a server. All you need is an IP address, which you can get, I presume and hope the university is blocking that if you want to use it for porn, but most people won't. You need an IP address, you need a computer with open source software on it, and if you want to get fancy, you need a domain name, and that's it. There's no blocks in the way. There's no application process. There's no one watching what you do with it. The whole system was designed to be decentralized and difficult to regulate and to take down. And this, on the whole, is a wonderful thing. But there are a lot of downsides. And perhaps the biggest downside is the availability of pornography. But that pornography, from a technological point of view, looks like any other traffic to the networks, to the internet service providers, to the trunk lines, to the data centers, porn is zeros and ones. They don't know what is in there. Increasingly, it's encrypted. The more we become concerned with security, the less we can see what it is that's being moved around the internet. And unlike in China, the government does not play a role in looking into those packets of data. We keep the government in America at arm's length. To change that, however virtuous the cause would be to radically alter how much power Washington, D.C. has. I don't want that per se. I certainly don't want that as a conservative. And I'll finish by saying this. I don't think it would work even if we tried. Think about the irony here. Go back to when music started to be downloaded. Go back to the days of Napster or LimeWire. Kids were downloading music, and their parents were confused. In other words, the power was with the young people. Now that ended, but how did it end? It ended because the music industry, which is one of the most voracious capitalistic forces in the world, gave in. They basically said, all right, we'll do this ourselves. They created Spotify, Apple Music, Tidal, and others. And in doing so, they essentially prevented people from being able to make a fortune making music as they had once been able to. If you want to make money in music now, you tour. There is not much money in records. They gave up. Now, of course, I'm not suggesting that we start Spotify or Apple Music or Netflix for porn, 
But I am saying that if the music industry looked at the problem that I've just described and said, you know, the only way around this is to try and deal with it, accept the problem and deal with it, when you had three or four sources, not 25 million, then we've got our work cut out. And I will uh, talk a little more constructively about what we can do, which is very important as well when it comes to the second part of this debate. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Charlie. Now we're gonna move into rebuttals. Each of our uh, debaters will have a maximum of eight minutes to talk, and then we will engage in a discussion among us. So, Ali, come, you have up to eight minutes. You don't have to take your full eight minutes, but um, the floor is yours. Sure, thank you. I don't think I'm going to take eight minutes at all. I, I don't have the same technological background and understanding the coding and the zeros and ones. I do appreciate the practical difficulties that would go into regulating, restricting something like pornography. And I do understand that with every policy that you're implementing, every time that you're asking the government to step in, you are absolutely asking for a trade-off. I simply believe that whatever difficulty we may face in banning porn or severely, strictly regulating porn, even the big wigs of pornography like Pornhub is worth it. I think it is an acceptable trade-off. And we've already seen what that looks like. I actually don't think that prohibition is a good comparison at all because alcohol is not inherently in itself abusive. It is not inherently in itself immoral and objectifying. Someone can have a glass of wine or maybe even a bottle of wine and be okay. That can be healthy. That can be something that someone does on a daily basis, but there is no healthy way to use porn. There is no healthy, moderate consumption of the objectification of another human being. So I don't think that's a good comparison. And um, I'm not sure that Char Charles made this uh, argument, but I have heard that similar to prohibition, that banning something like pornography, it's just going to push it into the dark web and it's just going to make things worse. But that could, that could be said for any law anything that we ban. I mean, that is basically what they say about abortion, and I assume I'm among a lot of pro-lifers here, that if we ban abortion or we restrict abortion, that it's going to be moved to back alleys. But what we remember when we are talking about abortion is that abortion affects an innocent human being, and the same thing is true of pornography. And so just like child pornography, even though it still exists, it still exists on the dark web and as I argue it, it still exists on these pornography websites that are there because it's legal. We still have said, you know what, that trade-off is acceptable. Whatever effort the government has to make, the state has to make to step in and hold consumers and producers of child porn liable, that is an acceptable trade-off. And I'm saying that I think that we can and should do that with pornography in general. Even if your only concern is child pornography, again, as I said, legal porn is the loophole for child pornography and trafficking and the monetization of rape. So I don't deny that it would be difficult, that there are practical obstacles, and I think that's absolutely worth debating. That's true when it comes to any policy debate, but when we are talking about the exploitation, objectification, and abuse of human beings, and then we look at the ripple effect that that has had on our, on our society, I'm not sure if there are very many other debates more worth having than this one. Um, so it's not enough for me to simply say the trade-off would be too much. I don't want the state to step in here. If we don't want the state to step in when it comes to the monetization of a rape online, then I, I, I'm not sure where else we would draw the line. So um, it's worth any pragmatic difficulties and policy debates that we may have. And again, I think in general, it is an acceptable trade-off. So just a, a few points on those points. Um, I agree it's a weak argument to say per se to ban something is necessarily to drive it underground. We don't take that view invariably. 
And in this case, it's not a particularly strong argument against banning porn. It is true, though, uh, solely in the sense that if you get rid of pornography that is hosted by big companies with shareholders, you are, by definition, uh, driving traffic unless you get rid of the demand, which is not what we're talking about here. The motion is to ban pornography. That's a supply side policy. You are, by definition, driving people to sites that are illegal. And most likely, given the way the internet works, you are driving them to sites that are foreign, sites that are hosted in Russia or Malaysia that don't have any rules whatsoever. Now, perhaps you think that's worth it. As I say, I don't think that's a dispositive argument, but I do think it's true. Uh, you are abdicating any right to regulate when you ban something. In terms of prohibition versus porn, of course, it's not a perfect analogy, um, but prohibition was the end of the temperance movement, not the beginning. As with the war on drugs, which is been ramped up and ramped up. Prohibition was people concluding that you couldn't partially ban a product. You couldn't half-heartedly ban a product. We tend to do this in America. We start a project and then we let it run out of control. And the reason I bring up prohibition was that by the end of prohibition, People simply did not think that the costs that were being paid were worth even the most laudable of goals, to the point at which a supermajority of Americans re-amended the Constitution. This is not a level of support we see in America now. Ali said we need to have the will. We don't have the will. Maybe we should have the will. Maybe the country would look different if we had the will. Maybe the will is the first step toward actually doing this. But we have to live in the country we live in. Like Ali, I am fervently pro-life. I'm also aware that a majority of Americans does not agree with me, at least in the first trimester. I wish profoundly that they did. I think it's the killing of an innocent life. I'm not compromising on it myself. I'm never going to recommend that anyone backs off that question. But what have we seen happen since the correct decision in Dobbs that overturned Roe? We've seen state after state after state, almost exclusively, when it held a referendum, yield a pro-choice result. That's a fact. That is a fact that a pro-lifer such as myself has to acknowledge. We haven't won that argument yet. I believe that we will eventually, but we haven't won that argument yet. We're a lot closer to winning that argument than we are to winning the argument that pornography ought to be banned. This doesn't poll well. Again, whatever that makes you conclude about other people or the United States or what you will, conclude it, but it's true. And that's the first thing to consider in public policy. Americans don't want to do this, and as such, what it would take to do it is going to cause a massive backlash. There is not the will, so there can't be the way. And the last thing I would say, purely because I didn't get to it before, is that I think insofar as that will ought to exist or be encouraged, it ought to be among the people who are already persuadable. Parents, in my experience, don't realize how bad this is. There are almost no parents in America who wake up in the morning and think, I don't care what pornography my 10-year-old looks at. They might not realize how easy it is. We have just not done a good job in the private sector, both at the parenting level and at the software development level, of presenting parents with tools to prevent children, and I think that is the biggest challenge, preventing children from accessing pornography. If you go, and I don't say this from personal experience, I hasten to add, but if you go on an airplane and try and go to a porn site, it doesn't work. If you go on a cruise ship, you try to go to a porn site, it doesn't work. If you go to a corporate office and you try to go to a porn site, it doesn't work. Now, of course, it does work if you go to one of the 25 million that isn't prominent. But there are organizations out there that keep track as close as is possible 
to the main purveyors of pornography on the internet, and they charge quite a lot of money to corporate office buildings or American Airlines or Princess Cruises to have a master list that is constantly updated that prevents those private institutions from facilitating access to pornography. Why this has never been commercialized at the family level is beyond me. I think it is it's a free idea for you all if you want to go out and make a trillion dollars. Why that has never been commercialized is beyond me. Why it hasn't been picked up by the internet service providers as an opt-in is beyond me. There's no parent in the world that wouldn't tick that box on their home router, you would say router. <laughs> and the last thing here is Ali is right in the sense that we need to talk about this more. It's actually a super awkward topic. When I was asked at various points in the last couple of days, oh, why are you going to Dallas? I didn't say, to talk about porn! You know, was, oh, it's a, it's a debate about a sensitive and political topics to do with uh, personal morality and uh, online access. <laughs> it's awkward, but if this is the problem that we all seem to agree that it is, we actually do need uh, to talk about it more. And more people need to speak up without fear of the people with whom I don't agree on the libertarian side who think that this is a clear-cut First Amendment issue and anyone who dissents is a prude. So I'm not standing here nihilistically and saying there's nothing that can be done, we shouldn't care about this, give in. I'm saying that Washington, D.C. and the power of the federal government permanently disfiguring the way that the internet works is not the right solution, will not work, and should be the last thing, given the history of the last 10 years, that conservatives want. Thank you, Charles. And um, now we're just going to have a, a free-flowing discussion for the next 20 minutes about what you have both said. And please feel free to ask each other questions. I'll, I'll throw a few things out there. But um, I think for me, listening to you both, what stood out was the fact that both of you think that pornography is a very bad thing. Where you differ is over what we can do about it. I would like to ask you perhaps a nonpartisan question to start, but one that I think is it's close to my heart as a parent, and you're both parents of, of young children. How did having children change the way, if it did at all, you thought about the issue of pornography and regulation? I'll start with you, Allie. Okay. Um, yeah, I honestly don't think that it was something that I had thought about at all until a few years ago, and I'm not sure if it was having children that was the impetus or not, but looking back at um, some speeches that I've given, I think the first time I talked about it was 2020, which would have been right after I had my first child, so maybe subconsciously that was one of the reasons I started thinking about it more. I certainly did not know um, how affected children were by this and how early they were accessing pornography, how easy it was for them to access pornography. I mean, I thank the Lord that even though I grew up with the internet, not you know a smartphone, that that is not my story um, because it so deeply affects their mind and the neural pathways while children are still developing. And then of course the abhorrent existence, the grotesque existence of child pornography and how anyone could ever inflict that kind of harm on people and profit from it. And again, just kind of this realization that it is the pervasiveness of legal pornography that is allowing that illegal child pornography to go on to sites like Pornhub um, and to be watched and to be monetized. And I mean, through various depositions, Pornhub has said, ah, we don't really have a way, it's, it's impractical. There's too many videos out there. So there's really just nothing we can do about it. And I'm just not buying it in either direction. I'm not buying it from Pornhub. I'm not buying it from policy perspective. Um, so yeah, I think it's just made me think more about how children are personally affected by this. And yeah, it certainly kind of lights a fire under me. Yeah, I would say two things probably. The first is, I have two boys, and boys are morons, and until they're not. And I was a moron until I wasn't, at least most of the time. And uh, there was a certain point in my life, I'm 39 now, 
at which I thought, well, I'm mostly over my moron phase. And now I don't have to worry about that. And then I had two boys and I realized, ah, oh, but they're still in theirs. And this is a totally different question than self-discipline. You know, of course, I haven't perfected self-discipline, but at 39, I'm a lot better at it than I was at 19. My children have very little self-discipline because they're six and eight. And this is a different world than the one I grew up in with dial-up modems. They, the sheer scale of it online is something I have to think about. And of course, they're not, they're not gonna know the problem here unless they're, they're taught it. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is, I think when you have children, you probably become more committed to your spouse. It's not that you weren't before. <laughs> I didn't say I will and then think maybe, but it adds another dimension. And the research on what pornography has done to people forming those attachments with their spouse and sometimes acting as a substitute <laughs> for physical intimacy that leads to breakdowns in marriages, which then has a knock-on effect with young children. And that's newer research, for what it's worth, is something that's been a lot more on my mind since I had kids. Um, that, that is, a, again, a shift. I don't think it was as easy to be addicted to pornography 20 years ago, because there was a lot less of it and the internet was much slower. But now this is, this is having real uh, effects on the way people interact with each other and, um, and form bonds. And yeah, as a parent, that's, that's bothered me. Yeah, and I, I think you're right about that. I, um, you know, even living as I do in Budapest in Europe, talking to my colleagues uh, who are mostly young women at the institute where I work, to hear them talk about what dating life is like, and these are women age 35 down into their 20s, it's just another planet, you know? And it's all, it seems to me, because of porn. Uh, what men expect from women, the uh, one woman, a friend of mine at the Institute said, men don't know how to talk to women. Now, the young men, these are Hungarians, right? But I'm sure the thing is true in America. And they, th my colleagues, female colleagues theorize that it's because of porn. That and video games, that they've spent so much time living in, in the unreal world that they haven't talked to women. So uh, the point I'm getting at is it's not simply a matter of something restricted to personal or, or even public sexual morality. It affects so many aspects. It is getting in the way of younger people meeting each other and forming uh, strong bonds, family relationships, which is what our civilization depends on to, to carry on. So if, um, if that is the case, if it is having this immense civilizational effect, and it's not just about um, teenage boys or girls looking at dirty movies, um, why wouldn't we at least make an effort, even though, it, why should we make the perfect the enemy of the good, Charlie? Uh, and that you, you've, you explained a second ago how we can stop the biggest ones. We may not be able to stop all of it, but why not do that given the stakes? Well, I think the answer to that is that I don't think this is a question of making the perfect the enemy of the good or making inroads but seeing a few stragglers around the edges. I think that to knock one porn site off out of 25 million does nothing. I think to knock 24 million porn sites off out of 25 million does nothing. This is not like social media regulation. Now, I'm not gonna go that far afield. I, I'm largely against social media regulation. But I, when I write about it, always acknowledge up front, the government can do this. The reason that people use Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, and so on, is that they have network effects. There's hundreds of millions of people on them. That's why they are attractive. If you have hundreds of millions of users, you almost certainly have an office building and a tax identification number, and you fall under a whole bunch of federal laws. If the federal government, leave aside the constitutionality for a second, if the federal government wants to regulate Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, it, it can do that. Th they need to be kosher in the eyes of the law. They cannot function otherwise. And it's simply not the case that this is just gonna drive people into the arms of a smaller 
social media network. And even if it did, that social media network would, would then become very big, and it would have shareholders, and it would go public, and it would be subject to the same rules. So you can do that whether you should or not. But that's not how pornography works on the internet, because all you need is a domain name, an IP address, and a server. And Americans are going to be able to access it if they want to, unless you completely change the internet and make it more like China's, where all information is tracked and the government has a master list of what people can see and can't see. And also, there's a lot of porn in China, however good the Communist Party is. That's why I say that I, I don't think this is a matter of the, the enemy. I think this is impossible. I'm not arguing this undesirable. I am saying that the, the trade-off that is necessary would be so draconian, and especially given that people don't actually want this, at least yet, that it would be unworkable in a way that would cause a backlash and be counterproductive. Ellie, um, on, I I on those lines, I, I think about how, as someone who's been pro-life for a long, long time, I was shocked to see that when the, the decision came down from the Supreme Court overturning Roe, the correct decision, as Charles said, that so many Christians seemed shocked to see the states moving to uh, liberalize abortion law because it always seemed to me that all overturning Roe would do is turn it back to the states. Um, do you think that there... First of all, do you think that it, it is surprising that Christians didn't seem, many Christians in the pro-life movement didn't seem to see that coming? And does Charlie not have a point that, um, you know, you, you can't, we do believe you can legislate morality to a certain point, but when there's a phenomenon as massive as pornography on the uh, internet pornography, is it really the case that this is something that has to be fought primarily by converting individual hearts and making parents and individuals more vigilant about stopping it themselves? What's the argument mm. otherwise? Yes, you're right to make the comparison to abortion because I hear that a lot. I am um, an evangelical, and there's a lot of mushy evangelicals out there who call themselves holistically pro-life, and I'm answering your question about porn, but to make the comparison. Um, and what they typically mean by that is that they don't actually think that it should be banned, but that we should just be caring for people and changing hearts and changing minds, and maybe one day when we change the culture enough and we're putting enough you know, government programs in place and we've changed the culture enough, then finally it will be the right time to ban abortion and to implement laws. Okay, but we're not looking at it from what the perspective of what it is. Abortion kills a child, and because it kills a child, that child right now has the right to legal protection not to be murdered. And that's also how I view pornography, is that, of course, there is the possibility of a backlash. Of course, there are pragmatic obstacles to it. And... Uh, I, I see the difficulty in that. However, right now, we are talking about people being exploited and objectified, and I believe, as image bearers of God, they have the right, right now, under the law, to not be. Um, and so, for the sake of their protection, and because it is wrong and should be illegal to monetize someone's objectification, I think that the law can be a very good teacher because the law can be a teacher. The law can create stigma. The law can teach a lesson that something is wrong and deserves to be pushed into the dark corners of the internet or the dark corners of reality or back alleys or whatever. That's how abhorrent that action is. And I think the law has the possibility to change minds in this case as well. It's the same thing that we've seen with gay marriage. Most people weren't on board with gay marriage when Obergefell was decided in 2015, and of course, things have really changed. And so, of course, I would love for hearts and minds to change. Of course, I believe that. It's the same thing with abortion. Of course, I believe that we should be caring for those women. We should be fighting for their dignity, not just politically, but uh, on the personal level. And pro-lifers already do that, by the way. And Christians already are leading, uh, leading the charge against pornography. Like you were talking about how 
there are, you know, are tools in certain places to block pornography. Well, Covenant Eyes has been around for 20 years, and you can download these applications and these softwares to block pornography on your phone. So Christians have already been leading the charge for so long to change hearts and minds. We can do that forever and ever, but eventually we've got to say, okay, but do these people not legally deserve to be protected from this exploitation? Do they or do they not? I think that they do. Um, and I am not trying to minimize any of the potential um, trade-offs. I'm also a conservative, but I want my government to be big enough to ban the slaughter of babies. I want my government to be big enough to legally stop the objectification of particularly women and children, um, and that will require heavy restrictions of pornography. Okay, last question before we go to the audience. Uh, and we'll start with you, Charlie. I want you both to answer this question. What do you consider to be the greatest obstacle uh, in our country to reducing or banning uh, the use of pornography? I mean, you don't want it to be banned, Charlie, but, or you don't think it can be banned, but what do you think is the greatest obstacle standing in the way of porn, the reduction of porn use? The invention of the internet. It is the Wild West, and that is generally a good thing. The existence of that tool would make most generations gasp. If you think about what it can do, step aside for a moment from this, which is the horrendous dark underbelly of the internet, where people also sell weapons to gangs and drugs to children. But l think about it on the good side for a moment. The, there's no one in this room who doesn't, if they want it, have essentially the entire sum of human knowledge at their fingertips for free. And a human knowledge that is not at any point intersected. It's not the case in China, it's not the case in Russia. It's not the case in some places of Europe, but it is the case in the United States. That's an amazing thing. I was thinking the other day about my grandfather who died in 1993, so he's been dead 31 years, and he was a big tinkerer. He loved to build and he was a carpenter. And he had an early computer. And if he saw now how I put music on in my house, his head would explode. I take a phone out of my pocket that has a glass screen I can touch. I choose songs that are on a server somewhere in San Francisco, which then get streamed into my house and sent to a speaker in the corner, wirelessly. And then it comes on. And the whole transaction takes you know, 10 milliseconds. It's an extraordinary thing. Streaming, good streaming, Netflix, HBO, how some people get television, all of this, it's, it's incredible. But it's also so open that it turns the regulation or superintendence of the stuff you don't want into a nightmare. That's the biggest thing. I, I know you corrected yourself, but. I would be fine banning pornography. <laughs> I don't think there is a moral argument against it or a legal argument against it or a constitutional argument. My classical liberalism doesn't intersect here. This is just not what I think governments are established to defend. But the existence of the internet makes this a moot point and I think we have to shift the debate to people and families and churches and communities and private tech companies and maybe the ISPs themselves. And I'll just conclude on that by saying we are not winning on abortion, if that's the analogy. I too want a government big enough to stop the slaughter of the unborn. But what I'm watching is legislatures move faster than the public in a given state wants and then their laws being overturned and replaced with horrendous alternatives. This may be about to happen in Florida. So Florida, where I live, instead of doing 15 weeks, they did six. Six is great as far as I'm concerned. I'd like it to be zero. But they went with six, which is a lot less popular than 15. It's going onto the ballot in November. It will probably be overturned, and in its place, it'll be 38 weeks. That's what's going to happen. And that doesn't protect unborn lives. It, it's the right signal, but it doesn't actually do it. And I worry that that's what we will end up doing here too. Ellie, and I, I'll, I'll preface your remarks by saying that as, as a conservative and as a Christian, 
I see the, the unwillingness of so many parents to wake up and see what's really happening. They prefer not to know so they don't have to be responsible. And uh, I mean, I, I sympathize with Charlie to the extent that I think that there's a lot that we can do. I agree with you, we should do more. I'm more of a legalist on this. But there's so much we can do that most parents, even conservative Christian parents, don't want to do because it would mean they have to, like, they have to tell their kids, you can't have a smartphone. Or if you have a phone, you have to have these restrictions on it. And they don't want to be the, become the so-called enemies of their kids. What do you think? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And now, of course, I don't have teenagers. My oldest is four. So we are not quite there yet, um, although I am already starting to see the importance of you know, limiting screen time and things like that. And I think um, millennials, actually, we don't get a lot of credit for very many things, and rightfully so. However, I think that we were born at just the right time to where I see the damage of social media. Um, unlike, I, I would say, like my oldest siblings who are like 10 and a half years older than me, great parents, but they just weren't raised with the iPhone like I was. I got an iPhone when I was 15 years old. He got one when he was out of college. So just a big difference. I think that we realize the risk of social media and um, its usage and screens and things like that more than Generation X and the older millennials, but we weren't so infected by it and so addicted to it that we are also, we're not numb um, to its effects too. So I think that we have a kind of a balanced understanding of the goods of technology and also the importance of regulating it, especially for our kids. I interviewed a dad um, last year, and this doesn't have to do with porn really specifically, but um, I don't know, he's probably in his 40s or so, and he had a straight-A student, a son, 16 years old, and because they trusted him, they thought he's responsible and he's you know, making good grades, he's on the football team. Um, they allowed him to have his phone anytime he wanted to. He was on Instagram. He ended up getting, um, uh, being a victim of sextortion, and he killed himself that night. And this father now is so brave. He's coming on my show and other people's platforms talking to parents about you think that you know what's going on behind that screen. You don't. Even your most responsible kid, even your sweetest kid, even the kid who would never do anything wrong, they don't have the ability. Once they've stumbled upon that conversation, that image, they often don't really have the self-control, as Charles was saying, to be able to resist that. Gosh, we're putting so much responsibility on kids these days to be able to do what many adults can't even do, and that's resist pornography. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but I've just realized more and more what a detriment and how damaging just access to any internet is for young people. Yeah. Okay, so let's turn to the, uh, is something you want to say, Charles? No, before? I just, I completely agree. <laughs> I just, I, I just can't underscore that more. I, just a very quick example of this. My eight-year-old has his friend and he always borrows his parents' phone. So my parent, my kids aren't getting phones until they're 18, but he borrows his parents' phone when they're out at the beach. And um, there's this character from some horror movie, not my thing, Freddy, I don't know what it is, but it's kind of scary and he's scared by it anyway. And what you realize is, so that didn't exist in my eight-year-old's world till he saw it, but now he has nightmares about it. Right, because his friend borrowed his mum's phone that I didn't know about, and his mum brought up this horror movie character and showed him a picture of it. And now that's part of the world. Uh, now think what it's like for a 10-year-old to see hardcore pornography. I mean, they don't have that as a thing. Um, so, I mean, keep your kids off the internet is a really good piece of advice. Well, yeah, my, um, uh, my youngest is 17. I have three kids, my youngest is 17, so we've gotten through that, and it's incredibly difficult. One of the most difficult things, and I say this as a Christian parent who raised his kids in a classical Christian school, other Christian parents are often your biggest enemies on this because they don't want to make the hard choices. Uh, many of them don't want to make the hard choices. And you can do the right thing. You can curate what your kids uh, watch on media. You can keep them off the phones. You can do all the things. But if all it takes is one person in their peer group, and there's always more than one person, 
whose parents either don't care or don't want to care, just pretend they don't see, and it spoils the whole thing. So this is why it's so important to be, not just to do the right thing in your own family, but try to find a strong peer group and community for yourself to be embedded in, because otherwise it, it's almost impossible. And a friend of mine is actually down in Austin, a guy named Sean Clifford, you might have heard of him. He helped found one of these companies that produces software that protects from pornography. And I remember having dinner with him in New Orleans once a few years ago, and he told me about what his day at work is like. And he's a, a believing Orthodox Jew, um, good man, a father, a husband. And I, I just couldn't, when, by the time he finished, I, my jaw was on the, on the table because it's that bad. So how, whether we do it by legislation, by personal stigma and, and uh, 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 convincing people to turn away from it or some mixture of the two, it's something that is urgent. Now let's turn to the audience and see if anybody has any questions. Sebastian has a, a microphone and um, he's gonna be passing around. Raise your hand if you have a question and please make it a question, not a speech. All right, folks, so go ahead and raise your hand if you have a question. I'll bring it to you, and we ask that you remain seated while I ask your question to give our cameras a clear shot. I hope you can see them, Sebastian, because I can't. My name is Heike. I go to Baylor University. Allie, I'm a big fan. Um, as someone who was exposed to pornography at age 11, I definitely know the effects, and so I appreciate you guys coming to speak to us. I wanted to ask if let's say we were successfully able to ban pornography, what effect, whether culturally, culturally or legally, do you think that would have on the pervasiveness of homosexuality or transgenderism in our society, if any? Um, well, I, I think it would have an effect. I don't have data for you. I don't have numbers to show the quantifiable effect that it has had, but because of um, one thing I mentioned, and I was just shocked to see them on camera admit this in the undercover investigation that I referenced, but one of the employees of ALO, which is the parent company of Pornhub, saying that that is how their algorithms work. And of course, they see it as a good thing is that they purposely are trying to get particularly male users who are looking usually at heterosexual content they might suggest over on the side what about this transgender content what about this homosexual content now i am not saying that that is the number one driver of homosexuality or transgenderism but i think that we would be foolish to say that it that it doesn't have any effect, that there is no potential uh, impact because pornography has the power to rewire your brain and to change your desires. That's actually the people who are sex positive and pro-pornography, they say that is a positive thing. You have to um, be promiscuous and watch porn to see what you like. Really, porn is telling you what to like. Um, so I think it would have an effect definitely have an effect on transgenderism. I have the somewhat unpopular opinion that uh, transgenderism, particularly in men, is primarily driven by pornography, primarily driven by pornography. Um, and so I think that we would see a lot of that go away because transgenderism in men is primarily a sexual fetish, not gender dysphoria or confusion. Um, and that is driven by the pervasiveness of very, very disgusting forms of pornography. So I think that it would help a lot in that particular regard. You mentioned the whole, um, the Wachowski brothers, the Matrix uh, guy brothers, and one of them said he became trans because of sissy porn. You've also probably heard of Andrea Long Chu, who is one of the top uh, uh, writers and intele public intellectuals on this issue. This man, male to female transsexual, has said the same thing that it was sissy porn that did it, that destroyed their masculinity. And what you say about Pornhub and the algorithm, it really is true. It's not simply a matter of showing you a menu of choices. It's all about dopamine and what your brain uh, it, it gets accustomed to. And so you, once you get on that spectrum, unless you find a way to stop it, it's going to make you seek out more and more perverted forms of sexuality and pornography in order to get the same dopamine hit. So it can't help but change you in concrete ways. Charlie? 
Yeah, so I, d I don't know as much about this from the pornography side as, as you two, but I think the internet is obviously a, a vector of some of these ideas. Uh, I'm not... Uh, I am. I'm pr a pro-gay conservative. I suppose I've always been fine with gay marriage. It's one thing we we differ on. Um, the trans thing, I think, is crazy, especially when it affects children, and it seems just profoundly obvious if you look at the data. I think Jonathan Haidt just wrote a book about this. That especially teenage girls are being inundated with transgender content. Leave aside pornography, just on social media and on the internet, and it's led to a self-identification rate that is obviously not organic. And the same is true with LGBT self-identification. You know, I if you think maybe two, three, four percent of the public historically has been gay, more of them are now out than were, but there are statistics showing that 35 percent <laughs> of Gen Z says <laughs> that they're LGBT, that's not true. That's just not true. That is a social contagion. So pornography is probably having a big effect on it, but the internet in general is presenting people with ideas at formative parts of their life uh, when people are the most confused. I mean, you all remember what it was like being 13, right? It sucked. And suddenly you're, you're given all of these ideas over the, over the internet, and it's clearly having having an effect i mean this is seems so obvious to me now even bill maher keeps saying this on his show to the booze from the audience even, but bill maher. even bill maher is saying the internet's clearly responsible for this so it's clearly having a massive effect outside of porn another question <coughs> ali and charles thank you for uh, being here today uh i might ask um what can we do as students that you know are coming here and then going back to our campuses, what can we do to uh, raise this awareness um, about the effects of pornography? Yeah, and sorry, I can't see you. So if I'm not looking in the right direction, I'm sorry about that. But um, yeah, I mean, just on a personal level, I, I don't know how dudes talk to each other about this kind of stuff. Maybe it's more awkward be than girls talking about it because it's, it's increasingly also a female issue, consumption of porn, absolutely more than it used to be in the past, but it seems to still be lopsided towards men because men and women are different. Our drives are different, our psychology is different, and so um, I think women can kind of talk about it in a more abstract way that maybe makes it more comfortable, whereas most men have viewed porn at some point, and so talking about it from a very personal perspective, I understand, could probably be very difficult and vulnerable, and yet it is that kind of vulnerability in talking about the impact that porn has had in your own life, on your relationships, or on the lives and relationships of people in your life, people that you are close to that can really make an impact because what we're hearing out there is that it's just no big deal. That, I mean, there are even activists who say that it's not addictive in nature, that it's actually conspiracy to say that pornography is addictive at all, that's real, it's a talking point out there, and that it's fine, it's just a healthy part of sexuality, and it's so clearly not. And so being the first one that's willing to have those conversations with friends, to not egg on those conversations that are just in good fun, that objectifies women or objectifies other people, I think that's probably a good place to start. Um, I'm sure maybe Charles has other suggestions too, even from the male perspective, but um, certainly as, as Christians, like we can start there. We can start from the biblical perspective too, that gosh, Jesus said that it was better to <coughs> gouge out our eye than to look lustfully at a woman. And if you've looked lustfully, then you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. And so if I'm speaking to a group of Christians here, of course, that is the objective standard that we can stand on as well. I would just add that if this is something you feel strongly about, then just say it. To me, this is one area where it really is like the pro-life issue. It's often not cool being a conservative. And it's tempting just to sh shut up and let it go. But you know, I I if you 
want to make a difference. You actually just have to say, you know what, actually I'm pro-life. And this is an odd thing for me, because I'm not religious at all. I never have been. I'm married to a devout Catholic. My children are being raised Catholic. I'm very open to it, but I wasn't raised with it, and I don't have it. And yet, I have always been pro-life, ever since I was three, I guess, when I first thought about it. <laughs> Well, it seemed obvious to me, right? Don't kill unborn children. It's one of those things where you go, really? Um, but it doesn't make you popular when you say it. I mean, I can remember being in college, and there were two of us, two of us, who were pro-life. The other guy was a devout Catholic. And it, it sucks when you go, actually, no, I don't think we should murder unborn children. And people look at you like you have two heads. Well, this is another of those issues where you just have to say, actually, I think pornography is bad. Don't do it. And deal with the consequences of it. You also, and I say this as someone who's slightly older than you, I, it also doesn't matter once you're out of those social situations because you don't stay friends with the people who would care <laughs> that you have different views or you're true to yourself. So, you know, you get to 39, you go, why was I trying to be cool? <laughs> why, why, why would that matter? That's really true. The day you graduate college, <laughs> everything is different. I would just add, as someone who's much older than you, I, I was in college in the 1980s, before the internet, so internet pornography obviously wasn't a thing, but pornography did exist. You had to work hard to find it. But I remember I wasn't a Christian in college and was barely even a conservative, but I had a deep aversion to pornography. But I never, ever talked about it because as a male, I was ashamed. I was afraid that my, my male friends would think I was gay, would think I was prissy, would this, would that. So I, I didn't participate in ever watching pornography, but I never dared to talk about it. And I kind of wonder now, I'm 57 years old now, I wonder how many other young men on that campus would uh, secretly felt like I did. They had a deep aversion, maybe because of the way they were raised, to pornography, but they were afraid, and they thought they would be alone in standing against pornography. And it certainly wasn't coming from any sort of ideological point of view. It was just I was raised to respect women, even though I wasn't religious and even though I was fairly liberal back in the 80s. I was raised to respect women. Pornography was considered to be something shameful in the way I was raised. End of story. I wish I'd had the courage to be open about it, not necessarily preaching on the street corner, just be open with my male friend and said, you know what, I don't believe in that. I believe it's wrong. I believe it degrades the dignity of women, and I believe it degrades my own dignity. And just let the chips fall where they may. But um, I wasn't that courageous in college. I hope you young men do find that courage. Someone else. Hi, y'all. My name is Lindy. Um, Charles and Allie, thank you for coming. So I go to Angelo State, um, and I would say that we're probably one of the <laughs> more moderate, less conservative schools, um, probably amongst everyone here. Um, and if we do have a big conservative body, it's more fiscally conservative than it is socially. Um, as a Christian, something I've seen on my campus that I struggle with, um, and this question is for Charles, is that do you feel like your stance that pornography can't be banned gives the pro-pornography side more ammunition because I would say that um, there are people who can hear both sides of these debates and still choose to be pro-pornography. Um, and I've, I've struggled with that. They've heard both sides, but they're not Christians. So the way we're talking right now, like, um, we know it's morally wrong. We know about being a, they, they don't know Jesus, and they don't understand that, and you can give them the gospel, and they can still choose to go against it. So do you believe that you could be giving them more ammunition? Like, hey, we have a someone who's against pornography, and they still don't think it can be banned. Yeah, in the short run, but no in the long run. In a, in a sense, it's like drugs. So I wrote a book a few years ago, and I argued that the drug war was lost and that its effects are deleterious, and that drugs are terrible and you shouldn't take them. I, mean, I, d I don't think that you should go and take heroin. I think that would be a really bad idea. I don't think you should smoke weed, not because I'm prissy about it, but because it makes people stupid and annoying. And that exists separately from the question of whether or not the drug war 
is working. I mean, I said earlier, a lot of the aims of prohibition were really valuable, and it did reduce the harm, especially domestic violence. But it was repealed. Now, was that repeal an endorsement of domestic violence? Of course not. In the short run, yeah. If somebody who has uh, a, a pro-porn, let's call it an actually pro-porn view, finds arguments that I've just made, they will probably use them. But I think in the long run, it helps at least me with that view to, to be honest about what I think the <coughs> consequences are. Now, you know, Ali and I disagree about that practical element, so that's fine. But if I pretended that I had a different view just because it lined up with what I would like to be the case, I, I don't think in the long run that helps anyone. Um, I, I just think they're separate, they're separate questions. Um, also because I believe, and this is we're going back to the core debate of the night, but I believe that if you push too hard on this in a way that is impractical, you will actually do more harm than good because you'll create this backlash. And then people won't be saying, well, have you heard, I mean, not that anyone's saying this, have you heard what Charles Cook said where he doesn't believe that you can ban pornography? They're going to say, did you see what happened when we tried without having a lot of public support? It was a disaster. And at that point, no one's going to want to try it again. I mean, when was the last person you heard suggest we prohibit alcohol? It just doesn't happen. Okay. But let me ask you a question about the prohibition or of drugs. And in Seattle and Portland, they gave up on decriminalization. Um, and now they're recriminalizing because it turns out if you decide the drug war is lost and say, OK, we'll, we'll make it legal, it becomes so much worse. So could you not? argue that um, even though uh, uh, banning porn or severely restricting porn could create new problems, there could be an analogy there to the drug war that the, the free-for-all we have now, the veritable free-for-all, makes it so much worse. I mean, is there, is there an analogy there? I can certainly see that argument. The reason I don't conclude that is twofold. First off, as I've said, there are 25 million sites, so I, I don't believe that you can make a difference in the way that you can make in the drug war. So the, the drug war, the trade-off, I think, is a bad one. But you are right. If you put enough resources in, you can restrict a lot of drug use and, and uh, sale. And th that is not automatically replaced by something else, because you've taken away the goods or you've, you've taken away the source, which is not true of porn. I mean, one site goes down, the next one's there, and so on and so on and so on. Um, the second thing is that the experiment requires giving the government powers that would be almost impossible to take away. Whereas with drug enforcement, whatever disagreements we might have about it, you can tell police, enforce this, don't enforce this. Enforce this more than you are, enforce this less than you are. Focus on this drug or that drug or this area or this problem. Whereas with the internet, it's sort of on or off. Y you're either tracking the contents of data packets on networks or you're not. You're either deciding what data is allowed to come into the United States in Ashburn, Virginia, and on the West Coast, or you're not. And I really do not trust the federal government with that power, and I don't think we'd get it back. We have time for one more question. This is primarily for Charles. I get this, I completely understand that you are completely against pornography morally, and that you think morally we should ban it, like that sort of thing, but it seems like we're just stuck where morally it's completely degenerate and abhorrent and we should ban it. But if practically it's impossible, what should we do? I'm just not satisfied with this idea that, that um, the consequences of banning pornography will be much worse than they are good. So what should we do? Well, work hard. The pace of change with things that are worse than pornography has historically been quite slow. Slavery was abolished by a war. It took 600,000 dead Americans to do that. I'm glad that happened, but that should show you the scale of the entrenchment. The pro-life cause is still being lost. I mean, the scale of the death is it's unimaginable. It might take a hundred years. You have to work. I mean, look, 
if I'm outvoted on this and the federal government gets the powers that I just described and tries this, I think it will fail, and then I think it will make everything worse as well, and I think we'll have got neither. But if I'm outvoted on it, it will be tried. But I think that even if I lose that political fight and the people who want to push this to the federal level get their way, I think we're going to end up with the same question, which is, well, <laughs> this hasn't worked, now what? And the answer can only be work politically, try and convince people. But look, I'm not religious, as I said, but one of the reasons I'm a conservative is because I think that, in some sense, man is fallen, imperfectible. You cannot perfect human beings. They are going to be sinful, in s however you construe that. Conservatives get this, progressives don't. You know, if you look at the American Revolution, the, the, the core insight in the American Revolution is that human beings are the same 2,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, as they are now. They're ambitious, there is evil, and so on. The French Revolution said, no, 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 no. We'll start the world anew. The Soviet Union, the Chinese uh, revolutions, they said, no, we'll start the world anew because we can perfect man. And they come up with these ideas. New Soviet man, is he's going to lead the way, and he's perfectible. And in 10 years, if we just kill everyone who's bad, right? then in 10 years, we'll be a much better country. The founders didn't do that. That's not what America is about. <coughs> they were actually very conservative in some ways. They took the ideas that had worked from, from Britain. Well. If you believe, and you all do so from a theological perspective, presumably, in a way that I don't, but if you believe what I've just said, then you are going to have evil and sin in the world. And the way that you fix that over time, insofar as you can, because you're not going to get rid of all of it, as you all know, the way you fix that over time is you work extremely hard, and you proselytize, and you explain to people why they're wrong. And I do think over time um, that is likely to improve things. But I don't know if we can fix this in the sense that we can move into sunlit uplands where this is gone. And I wish we could, but I don't believe that, and as a result, I'm not going to say that I do. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. I know some of you had questions, but we're going to move to hospitality, and uh, Charles and Ali Beth will be around to answer your questions, I think. So don't be shy. Come up to us and talk to us. We're here for you, and we're grateful you're here. Ali Beth, Stucky, Charles Cook, thank you for coming tonight, and thank you all for being here. <laughs>